So you've decided to resurrect your brand for a new generation. Your original concept is solid and darn it, you know there's still potential for it to resonate. The question is how far are you willing to go? Will it be a moderate reboot, a safe, considerate reboot, or something more? Hi, I'm Dan Larson and this is the history of Extreme Ghostbusters. to establish titles for sponsoring this video. Use promo code TOYGALAXY to get 10% off your order today. Established Titles is a project based on the historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lords or ladies. It allows you to buy as little as one square foot of dedicated land so that you too can call yourself lord or lady. You could literally officially change your name to Lord or Lady on your credit card or plane tickets. You could add it to your dating profiles, add it to your YouTube channel. It's also a fun way to help preserve the beautiful woodlands and biodiversity of Scotland while supporting global afforestation efforts. Established Titles works with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts because Established Titles is committed to planting a tree with every single lorder, every single ladier. Every title pack grants you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Eddleston, Scotland, and an official certificate with a crest. Your certificate features a unique plot number with which you can see the exact location of your land. Established Titles told me that the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot within a few minutes of walking. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, we can build my A secret galaxy kingdom. Established Titles is running a sale right now, plus if you use the code TOYGALAXY you get an additional 10% off, so go to EstablishedTitles.com slash TOYGALAXY to get yours today. Thank you again to Established Titles. Extreme Ghostbusters is a 40 episode animated series that originally aired in syndication in 1997. It is a continuation of the real Ghostbusters animated series that ran seven seasons from 1986 to 1991. New Ghostbusters, same old slime. Same old slimer. Extreme Ghostbusters takes place years after the Ghostbusters have essentially cleaned up the town. They have busted all the ghosts. In this case, there is such a thing as being too good at your job. Original Ghostbusters Ray Stantz, Peter Venkman, and Winston Zeddemore have all moved on to other pursuits. Egon Spengler is now a community college professor, but still lives in the original firehouse, tending to the containment unit and making sure Slimer has all the hot dogs he can eat. Egon teaches Paranormal Phenomenon 101 and this year has a total of four students enrolled. That's twice as many as last year. Some skeptics, some believers, and some just looking for the easy A. Garrett Miller is a wisecracking athlete that uses a wheelchair. Roland Jackson is the intellectual and engineer. Kylie Griffin is the goth girl who lives and breathes the occult. And Eduardo Rivera thinks this is all a bunch of simple tricks and nonsense. They're going to learn by doing because city employees digging a new subway tunnel have accidentally unearthed an ancient evil spirit that requires busting. Egon and the new team will be supported by Janine Melnitz, who still has feelings for Egon, and Slimer, who still has enough slime for everyone. The movie Ghostbusters came out in 1984 and instantly became a pop culture phenomenon, doing nearly $300 million at the box office. Two years later in 1986, the Ghostbusters Adventures came home to television with an animated series called The Real Ghostbusters, which we have previously covered on this channel. The cartoon was kind of the same as the movie, but with noticeable changes, different voice actors, and a complete overhaul of the likenesses. For the next five years, the Ghostbusters franchise was one of the hottest pop culture franchises in existence, but that ended in 1991 after two feature films and 140 episodes of the cartoon. In 1996, Sony Pictures Television wanted to get the Ghostbusters franchise back in the spotlight with a new series, ideally aligned with new toys and expanded licensing. It was first announced as Super Ghostbusters, a placeholder title meant to send a signal to networks that a new show was coming. Jeff Klein and Richard Rainus developed the new series. They were both producers on the Jumanji animated series. Rainus had written and produced a variety of shows from the ALF animated series to Starcom, Cops, and the real Ghostbusters. One of the initial ideas was to center Janine as the bridge to the next generation. It's 10 years after the last ghost was seen in New York City. The Ghostbusters have all gone their separate ways except for Egon, who can usually be found transfixed working on computers. As a history teacher at a local college, Janine would recruit her students to face the growing ghost 
ghostly threats, Lucas the wisecracking athlete that uses a wheelchair, Roland the clumsy, good-hearted, gentle giant who is a whiz with machinery, Kylie a girl genius who lives and breathes the occult, Eduardo a hip cynical slacker with a dream of becoming an Olympic runner, and Slimer is back with a new mischievous goblin sidekick named Nat. Developing this series was important because it was the first time since the franchise began in 1984 that creators had to ask themselves, is it the concept of the Ghostbusters that excites people, or is it the specific characters that fans connected to? Is it still Ghostbusters if it doesn't have Ray Stance, Peter Venkman, Winston Zeddemore, and Egon Spangler? Are viewers going to want to see a story about any Ghostbusters, or will they insist on more stories about THE Ghostbusters that have, to this point, been the only Ghostbusters? Turns out it wasn't really that much of a risk. The franchise had run its course. There was no third movie. Real Ghostbusters was cancelled because viewers weren't interested anymore. Toy sales had dropped off. Bustin' no longer made kids feel good. If the ratings aren't there and the toys aren't selling, the only option is to reboot with a hip new attitude. Extreme times call for extreme Ghostbusters. The 90s was all about being extreme, as the creation of the X Games by ESPN proved. The X Games were an attempt to directly engage the Gen X and Gen Y kids who were at the time the most valuable targets for consumer marketing, the number one demographic for Mountain Dew consumption, and a lot of pop culture followed that formula. So many grungy fonts. Rainus and Klein wanted to reinvent the Ghostbusters for the next millennium. Those real Ghostbusters were lame, out-of-touch adults, probably in their 40s. Time to cycle in some more relatable characters that would appeal to 90s teens. Klein and Rainus wanted to, quote, put together a team of misfits in a way, people that you would not necessarily associate with being superheroes on television. The diversity was by design. Early character concepts by Phil Barlow depict three of the four extreme Ghostbusters as girls, and Egon as a bearded, robed ambassador to the other side fighting to avoid a war of the realms. As episodes were being written, the characters began to evolve and find their real identities. Lucas was pitched by Barlow as Lucy and had proton-blasting leg braces and crutches. It was part of an attempt to create a female character that was fearless and gung-ho. However, Rainus suggested the switch back to a wheelchair and making the character a man named Garrett. Rainus and Klein brought Egon back to the forefront, making him the college professor instead of Janine. Slimer's sidekick Nat got dropped. Roland was no longer clumsy. Eduardo wasn't looking to make the Olympics. The new comparatively diverse cast featured James Marsden as Garrett. You might recognize James as Dash X from Erie, Indiana, or the voice of Binks the Cat in Hocus Pocus or Max Goof in a Goofy movie. Roland was played by Alfonso Ribeiro, fresh off his run as Carlton on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Eduardo was played by Reno Romano. Kylie was played by Tara Strong, whose list of acting credits is far too long to get into. Almost as many roles as Billy West, the voice of Slimer. Pat Music, another actor with a long resume, played Janine Melnitz. And in the interest of maintaining the connection to the previous series, The Real Ghostbusters, Maurice LaMarche returned to the role of Egon Spengler. If there's something strange in your neighborhood. Production design is inseparable from the 90s. The opening theme song reflects that with a grungy, Aerosmithy, Alice in Chainsy version of the original Ray Parker Jr. Ghostbusters theme. Written by Jim Latham and sung by Jim Cummings, who you may recognize as the voice of Darkwing Duck. The Extreme Ghostbusters production team was made up of several people that had worked on the real Ghostbusters, and that consistency helped strengthen the spiritual bond and continuity between the two series beyond the return of main characters like Egon, Janine, and Slimer. In the episode Grundle we learn that Kylie's interest in the supernatural is at least partially the result of events that took place in the real Ghostbusters episode, The Grundle. The Grundle is still trapped in the containment unit at the firehouse, but the things he did a decade ago, like kidnapping Kylie's childhood friend Jack, are still impacting the world today. It is rare for a cartoon franchise to have a second life. It is even more rare for that franchise to continue the story, acknowledging the actual passage of time between series. While extreme Ghostbusters function like a reboot, it is more a sequel operating with a a realistic timeline. 40 episodes of Extreme Ghostbusters saw the evolution of a team with nuanced relationships, characters that matured and grew into more complex versions of themselves and embraced their roles in the Ghostbusters mythology. But of all the things that haunted the Ghostbusters over the course of the series, none was more persistent than the specter of the original Ghostbusters. The real Ghostbusters. A fear that each of the Extreme Ghostbusters had to confront in their own way through the course of the series. Would they ever truly be accepted as THE Ghostbusters? 
The two-part series finale of Extreme Ghostbusters titled Back in the Saddle confronted this idea head-on. Janine organizes a surprise party for Egon's 40th birthday, attended by Peter, Ray, and Winston, all voiced by actors returning to the roles from the real Ghostbusters. The two-parter set up a direct comparison of where the two teams stood at the time and asked which one represented the future of the franchise. The real Ghostbusters now past their prime, their greatest adventures seemingly behind them, or the extreme Ghostbusters who were just coming into their own with their brightest days ahead. Head. By the end of the two episodes, both teams have come together, bringing all of their individual talents to the table to create one cohesive team of Ghostbusters to defeat the kaiju-sized Bermuda Triangle monster as it attacks New York. Longtime fans were able to take a moment and reflect on where the franchise began and the differences between the two teams, how much the mythology had expanded in the time since Extreme Ghostbusters began, and, of course, where the franchise could potentially be headed. At the time, that meant back into obscurity as it was once again the end of the franchise as an active part of the pop culture landscape. Extreme Ghostbusters was cancelled and there was no indication that either team would be busting into the future. When not out hunting for ghosts, which Extreme Ghostbusters most likely to be on the couch catching some Z's? There's something strange in your neighborhood. Eduardo. Extreme Ghostbusters was supported by a line of toys from Trendmasters as opposed to Kenner, who had produced the toys for the real Ghostbusters. Kenner was purchased by Hasbro in 1991, and at the time, Hasbro was likely more focused on the resurgence of Star Wars through Power of the Force and the continued success of Starting Lineup and Transformers Beast Wars. Trendmasters was hoping the original title, Super Ghostbusters, would have stuck. At a time when superheroes were influencing the design of nearly every single toy in the toy aisle, from Luke Skywalker to Gene Simmons to the Mighty Ducks. There are roleplay items like the Proton Pack and Ghost Trap. Almost all of the core characters get action figures Kylie, Eduardo, Roland, Egon, Slimer. There are monsters like House Ghost, Mouth Critter, and Sam Hain, who was never produced for Kenner's The Real Ghostbusters. The Ecto-1 and a very rare Ghost Blast and Buster Bike. There were even deluxe versions of Kylie, Eduardo, Roland, and Egon with blazing lights and authentic sounds, deluxe firing plasma blasters and ghost containment unit. The one very obvious omission was Garrett. One of the core Ghostbusters, he was left out of the line likely because Trendmasters decided it would be too expensive to produce his wheelchair, although it is highly likely that he would have been included in the next wave of toys if the line lasted one more year. A prototype of Garrett with a highly modified, more toyetic battle wheelchair was produced. Pictures can be found online, but as of this video has never been mass produced for sale at retail. Much easier to find are the kids meal premiums from KFC in 1997 in the US and Burger King in 1999 in the UK. Despite the attempt at bringing the Ghostbusters franchise back as a prominent pop culture property, very little other licensed merchandise was produced that we could find. Several games were released for Extreme Ghostbusters, including a Tiger Electronics handheld game, Extreme Ghostbusters for the Game Boy Color, Extreme Ghostbusters Code Ecto-1 for Game Boy Advance, and Extreme Ghostbusters The Ultimate Invasion for the PlayStation. You could also get Extreme Ghostbusters Zap the Ghosts, and Extreme Ghostbusters Creativity Center for PC. Episodes were released on VHS in 1999 separately or as a three-volume box set. Some of the episodes were uploaded to the official Ghostbusters channel on YouTube in January of 2021. As of this video, 10 of the 40 episodes, including the two-part finale Back in the Saddle, are available. No word on whether the rest of the series will be added at some point in the future. You can stream the entire season on Philo, Crackle, and Fubo. You ever feel like you're just saying words? Is it Philo? Philo. Philosopher? Is it short for philosopher? <laughs> Philo? The Ghostbusters franchise has taken a few twists and turns since Extreme Ghostbusters in 1997. Multiple attempts to reboot, reinvent, reimagine, and revive the franchise with and without the original cast with varying results. While Extreme Ghostbusters took deliberate steps to advance the mythology of the world as created by the real Ghostbusters, the media that has followed hasn't done the same for Extreme Ghostbusters. Not as explicitly, not as consistently. Is it canon? No. But also yes. But mainly no. See. IDW started publishing Ghostbusters comics in 2008, set in a timeline where the 1984 and 1989 movies and 2009's Ghostbusters the video game all happened. That's different from the timeline of the real Ghostbusters cartoon. We live in the future, where multiverses are now required of all legacy pop culture storytelling, so I don't have to explain how this works.
but I will. If a movie or video game project, a comic book or an action figure line needs to do something that contradicts anything in the established canon, they just have to clap their hands twice and say, <laughs> multiverse. Whatever the next thing is that gets released can use everything that came before it or nothing at all. Finally signed that actor who was in the series 20 years ago, broke your universe with a film that was rushed. Your cartoons are more beloved than your live action films, but you wanna be able to profit from all of it? Multiverse. In 2013, IDW put their regular Ghostbusters on the bench and introduced the new Ghostbusters. The new Ghostbusters were made up of Janine Melnitz, Special Agent Melanie Ortiz, Technician Ron Alexander, and a girl that works at Ray's occult bookstore, Kylie Griffin. This is a different Kylie Griffin. It's the Kylie Griffin of the IDW universe, but an homage to Extreme Ghostbusters nonetheless, like the inclusion of Garrett in the Crossing Over event in 2015, which saw the Ghostbusters multiverse break wide open, bringing together the real Ghostbusters, the IDW Ghostbusters, and the Extreme Ghostbusters. And not for nothing, but the most recent film, Ghostbusters Afterlife, addresses the main storyline for what happened to the original Ghostbusters from the first two films and does not address the events of Extreme Ghostbusters or any of the IDW comics, unless they want it to in the next film, probably called Ghostbusters <laughs> Multiverse. Ghostbusters weren't gone for long between the two animated series, but the industry itself matured a lot. Cartoons shifted away from existing explicitly to sell toys thanks to federal regulations introduced in 1991 and further cemented in 1997. The introduction of animation directed at older viewers like Batman the Animated Series in 1992 helped pave the way for stories that dealt with heavier subjects, stories that impacted the characters and caused long-term trauma, or helped them deal with trauma they had already experienced. Greater diversification of the Ghostbusters was a conscious choice made by the production team on Extreme Ghostbusters, partially a marketing decision based on expanding the demographics of the viewership to maximize potential profit, sure, but that doesn't change the reality of the characters that were created as a result. The writers on Extreme Ghostbusters chose to confront issues related to the new team head on. They chose to empower Garrett as a wheelchair user by not making that his most defining characteristic, by demonstrating that he was just as capable of busting ghosts as everyone else on the team. They chose to confront racial and gender stereotyping. They chose to create a team that was more representative of the audience that was watching. Kids who could aspire to be or relate to the kind of heroes the show was building. Flawed, misfit outcasts who find family in each other, who want to be good and do good for each other. There are three prevailing theories as to why Extreme Ghostbusters was canceled. One, dark subject matter. Regardless of the fact that Ghostbusters had always been about ghosts and monsters and the supernatural, extreme Dream, some have said, took it a little too far. R.L. Stein would probably disagree. Two, scheduling. The showrunners directly blamed the terrible early morning and inconsistent time slots. It was hard to find it, and if viewers did, it wasn't always there when they came back. Three, it wasn't the real Ghostbusters. As far as legacy brands go, gradual change over a long period of time is usually safe. Drastic, immediate change is generally rejected regardless of attempts that are made to connect it to the beloved source material. The audience that was returning from real Ghostbusters didn't find enough of the characters they had fallen in love with during the original series. Whether it was a genuine dislike for the new characters or an unwillingness to let them connect, the result was the same, something we unfortunately saw again in 2016. For new viewers, Extreme Ghostbusters was forced to demonstrate its value based purely on its own substance without relying on the connections to the original popular thing. Ultimately, the idea of Ghostbusters wasn't enough to save it. The franchise couldn't grow beyond those four defining characters, Peter, Ray, Egon, and Winston. And that's not a good sign for the future health of a legacy franchise. Star Trek pulled it off when Next Generation finally found its own voice and place in the Star Trek universe, opening the door to other Star Trek series down the line. Star Wars hasn't been as lucky. Ghostbusters has, over the years, wavered between continuation of the original timeline versus attempting to restart while maintaining the core concept, tone, and technology. Neither has been as successful up to this point. Perhaps 2021's Ghostbusters Afterlife has not only figured out how to solve the storytelling problem, continuing the timeline established by the first two movies, but also reached a point through the passage of time that the franchise has no choice but to move on from Peter, Ray, Egon, and Winston. Extreme Ghostbusters may have been ahead of its time, dealing with stories and storytelling that the audience wasn't ready for, having to advance the interests of a brand that needed to move on to survive at a time when the fan base refused to. The issues the show attempted to confront, intrinsic to its design, 
design were in many cases the things that made it a point of ridicule. A show that was created to evolve the franchise is today hardly remembered as ever having been a part of it. Ironically, if it were brought back today, if these Ghostbusters were the Ghostbusters, it is likely that it would be rejected even more forcefully. Because the world of 2022 is considerably more hostile to diversification than the world of 1997, even less accepting of change to legacy brands. Perhaps in the future, there will be a version of the Ghostbusters that is able to carry on the franchise without an appearance by the original four Ghostbusters. Perhaps intentional diversity will be a part of that team. And perhaps those extreme Ghostbusters will just be called the real Ghostbusters. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Please hit like and subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Check out our new merch store at beanscanon.com and let us know in the comments down below if you've ever seen Extreme Ghostbusters and if not, if you even knew it existed. It's one of those things that I am regularly reminded exists and then I immediately forget about. It's not the show's fault, it's my fault. I've never been a Ghostbusters guy, so it didn't really matter how good the show was. I was pretty much checked out after the first movie. It's been all downhill from there <laughs> for me. I'm so sorry, Game Dave. I still love Back to the Future. <laughs> Cut.